Maintaining personnel records. This is the statute that governs personnel records, 14952C. And it defines personnel records this way. A record kept by an employer that identifies an employee to the extent that the record is used or has been used or may affect or be used relative to the employee's qualification for employment, promotion, transfer, additional compensation, or disciplinary action. My advice to you is be more broad rather than more narrow in defining what goes into your personnel record. It's better to have more than less. <clears throat> uh, personnel records specifically include but are not limited to this information according to the statute. Name and address, date of birth, job title and description. Note, note it says job description. Uh, rate of pay, compensation paid, payroll records. Starting date, job application, <clears throat> resumes and inquiries prior to employment, inquiries in response to job postings or advertising. Uh, any waivers, waivers of rights um, are specifically mentioned in the statute, but I would recommend uh, that any documents that the employee signs be in their, um, their records, such as acknowledgement of an employee handbook, any restrictive covenants, non-solicitations, non-competes, confidentiality agreements, things of that nature. Uh, obviously, all performance evaluations and all evaluation-related documents, all discipline records, including written warnings and probationary periods, everything. Documents relating to any disciplinary action. So when it says documents relating to, I read that to mean not just the discipline itself, but any um, potential investigation or background information. Now, you may want to put investigation material in a separate file, um, but ultimately, depending on how the statute is read and the individual circumstances, it may be considered to be a part of the personnel records generally. Um, and of course, in the end, a termination notice, a dated termination notice, uh, goes into your personnel records. What do they not include? Okay, any information of a personal nature about another person, another employee, Many times when I'm reviewing personnel records, I do find information about other employees. Sometimes, for example, an employer will keep information and they'll have a list of various employees on a printout. So we want to be sure that we're being careful that only information about this employee goes into his or her personnel records. Um, employee medical information must always, always be kept separately. Anything regarding a worker's comp claim, disability application, request for sick time, doctor's note about accommodation, uh, FMLA application, anything regarding their medical condition should be in a separate file. Now, I-9 information. Um, I just recently had the opportunity to speak with an immigration lawyer at the Mass Bar Association. And I-9 information, as you know, is required uh, from every employee in order to document that they are qualified for employment in the United States. Um, there's a whole list of documentation that is, is uh, applicable to this and that satisfies the requirements. Now, this immigration lawyer who specializes in employment immigration uh, suggested that it's very important that you keep all the I-9 information in one place together because should you be audited, you do not want the authorities going through your personnel records, and potentially finding other violations. You want to make sure that you've got all your I-9 stuff organized um, in order of employment, in order of hire, and that it's all in one place so that it is separate. So then... Go ahead. From that slider, is it the position that I-9 information is not within the scope of the Section 52C of the personnel records statute? I think that I-9 information needs to be maintained separately, but you're right, but I think ultimately it is part of the personnel records. And I'm glad you asked that because one of the things that comes up oftentimes is that people think only what's in the personnel file or folder uh, constitutes personnel records. But as, as you've seen, the definition of personnel records is very broad, and so it may be that what actually constitutes complete personnel records is in various places. It's in HR, it's in uh, your supervisor's desk, 
It may be that a piece of it is in that I-9 binder. Um, so I would keep that in mind when people request their personnel records, which we're going to get to next. Okay, what are employees' rights under the personnel records statute? Number one, an employee, if they request it in writing, must be given access to review their personnel records within five business days. And that should be on the premises under your supervision. Number two, if somebody requests in writing a complete copy, a copy of their complete personnel records, you're required to provide that within five business days following receipt of the written request. Now very importantly, this is something that came into the law several years ago, and I know it's been difficult for employers to uh, integrate into their policies and practices. Notice to the employee within 10 days following placement in the record of any information that may negatively impact that employee. So let me read you this section from the statute. An employer shall notify an employee within 10 days of the employer placing in the employee's personnel record any information to the extent that the information is, has been, uh, used or may be used to negatively affect the employee's qualifications for employment, promotion, transfer, additional compensation, or the uh, possibility that the employee will be subject to disciplinary action. Very, very broad. So when we say may negatively impact the employee, I recommend to you that pretty much anything that is not glowingly positive must be in there. And if you're going to put in the negative stuff, you really should be putting in the positive stuff. But with respect to the 10-day notice, within 10 days of placing that in the, in the employment record, in the personnel records, the employee must be notified and given an opportunity to see whatever that is that's going into their record. So the easiest way to do this, as I recommended earlier, if there's not a written warning or some, something in writing, is to communicate by email. We had this conversation about your um, persistent tardiness, um, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful based on our conversation that, that, that this issue will be resolved and I look forward to continuing to work with you. This, a copy of this email will be placed in your personnel records. Now you've met this requirement. The documentation of that conversation that may negatively impact the employee is in the personnel records and the employee has been notified that it's in the employee record, in the em employee's record and not only have they been given an opportunity to see it, they've been given a copy of exactly what's going in. And I think for employers, if they make that a regular practice, that it makes it, a, a, it takes away the sting to employees of getting this notification. It becomes not so much of a big deal or something that's gonna cause a lot of upset. It's just the way business is done. You have these kinds of conversations, you get an email, it says it's going to your personnel records, it happens across the board and it's, so it's, it's not so shocking or upsetting. So the communications between a manager and the employee, those are sort of the e that's sort of the easy question about going into the personnel record and notifying the employee. I mean, to me this, this amendment is a bit of a rabbit hole in the, to the extent that you have a manager, say you have a manager send an email to HR. Employee Smith was you know, absent two days this past week or three days in the last couple weeks without notice, without, you know, without notice or left early or took an extended lunch break and it's an email from the manager to HR saying what do I do, giving you notice. First of all, is that, a, is that inter, and there, you know, in every company and every organization there are thousands if not millions of those kind of communications going on every day about employees. So this to me, I've never been comfortable that I've resolved, that we've resolved the question is A, is that email from the manager to HR, so and so was, you know, didn't, you know, was absent or came late to work three of the last five days? Is that a personnel record? Is that within the definition? And then do you have to take that email, put it in the personnel file, and then send the employee notice of that? My view <laughs> is that it absolutely is best practice to make that a part of the personnel records and therefore the employee should be, <coughs> excuse my voice, provided with a copy. <coughs> and here's my concern if those things, uh, 
the, those kinds of internal um, communications about problems with the employee don't go into the personnel records is that ultimately when the time comes, as we've talked about earlier, where you want to defend a legitimate business action, an adverse action, potentially discharge of this employee, if it's not in the personnel records and if the employee has not been given an opportunity to be notified that it's in the personnel records and to see it, then it may be down the road that we're going to be precluded from using that information uh, in a court of law. I mean, it's my view that ultimately the case is going to come where a plaintiff's lawyer is going to say um, this information, this negative information that ultimately negatively impacted my client was never, he was never notified, he or she was never notified of it, never had an opportunity to see it, therefore it's in violation of the statute and is not, an, and is not admissible as a defense against the discrimination claim. And, and I don't disagree with your reading of the statute on its terms, the point being that's almost an impossible burden, I think, for most employers to meet, have every sort of communication like that. And I, I find in my experience that most employers, yes, performance reviews, personnel action plans, pers uh, those things all go into the personnel record, but every sort of internal email conversation that, at an, about an employee that may negatively impact that person's performance, those are not, those are sort of the communications that most companies are not gathering, you know, hundreds by the day. I don't disagree with the, the way the statute's written, but the, the way it's written, it poses an incredible administrative burden. But I agree with Tamsin, what Tamsin said. I agree with her reading of it and the potential negative impact to the employer down the road in terms of justifying an employment decision. So, what, so you make a great point. This is a difficult to manage. It's cumbersome. But what I would recommend is certainly that you keep these requirements in mind because should there be a problem with an employee and should that ultimately lead to some kind of disciplinary action and possibly termination, we don't want to see <laughs> an empty personnel record or a personnel record, as we talked about earlier, with positive information. And then you give us you know, a pile this thick of emails from the manager to the HR and from HR to the manager that documented this employee's perf serious performance issues um, and never made their way into the personnel record. So certainly, once an employee is headed toward discipline or is becoming a problem, that's the time to remind yourself about this requirement and make sure that, uh, that those behind the scenes memos are getting into their personnel records. I think that's a reasonable compromise. Is um, notice satisfied with just sending the email, or do you need acknowledgement from the employee that they've received it and they know what's going in their file? Um, in, in my opinion, as long as you say, as, you, as long as you send it to them within your email system, and you say a copy of this is going into your personnel records, then within your email system, you 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 will have uh, the information that you need should you ultimately need it. I don't promote actually asking people to sign off and acknowledge receipt of each and every one of these little notices. I think that's too cumbersome. When it comes to some serious uh, written discipline, you will be having them acknowledge receipt. Um, so, yeah. So very quickly to proceed, I know this is a fascinating topic and all of you have all kinds of interesting questions about it. Um, right to contest in writing. So if there's a disagreement about information that's contained in the personnel records or the employee is requesting removal or correction, if you can't mutually agree on a resolution of this issue, the employee always has the right to contest in writing or put their point of view in writing into the personnel record. Now we're going to move on to, um, to newly published overtime regulations. I just do want to point out, people will tell you, and this is true, that the, this personnel records law applies only to employers with 20 or more employees. Bottom line is, it is a big mistake if you have fewer than 20 employees to just blow off the requirements of the statute. This is good practice, it's good guidance, it's, it's the way to conduct your business regardless of the number of employees you have.